What's going on, guys? Welcome back to The Control Room. I'm your host, Israel Johannes. Now, we've made it to episode 20. Only 1% of podcasts make it past this point. So it, it's great that we're already here and we're still pushing. I got more on the way. Special surprise coming in episode 21. I will tease that at the end of this episode. But for now, let's stick with the top topics. The Mavericks, Kyrie Irving finished off the Denver Nuggets. I know it's been a little bit. There's a lot to talk about since then, but that's where this whole episode starts. Kyrie with his crazy left-handed floater over Nikola Jokic. That's where we're going to start. Then the Mavs hit a season high across the league in dunks over Utah. And then we'll take a look at how high Dallas can go in the standings as well as potential playoff matchups. For the Pelicans, they got their revenge against the Miami Heat. And they somehow beat the Milwaukee Bucks. We're going to talk about those two wins specifically. We'll also take a look at how CJ has to play in the wake of Brandon Ingram's knee injury. Then for the Thunder, they took care of business against Memphis, Utah, and Toronto. Went on a four-game win streak. They also finished off the Pelicans in the clutch. All right, so we'll take a look at some of those games as well as the four-game win streak as a whole because... The Thunder's second chance points was actually something worthy of looking at, considering how they haven't done so well in that category all season long. All right, so let's start off at the very top. Kyrie Irving finishing off the Denver Nuggets. What led up to this moment? The Mavs were up 98 to 85 in the fourth quarter and then gave up the lead. Uh, we've seen that before. However, starts off with Jamal Murray taking the lead to 105-102 for Denver off of a three. Then the Mavericks are inbounding the ball. Luka is well off the top of the key. No one gets to him. He just takes a three, makes it. So now it's 105 all. And then after a stop, a timeout is called. So Jason Kidd is constructing a play for somebody to get open and then eventually score. Normally, the first option is Luka, but there are times when Luka runs as a decoy, depending on where the inbounder decides to go. This time, it's going to be Maxi Kleba, who has inbounded the ball plenty of times. He has experience doing it. Now, Luka is closer to the basket within the paint area. Kyrie's the one doing a lot of off-ball action. Getting closer to Maxi, takes the ball, gets around Jokic, left-handed floater. I put up a short on that about 11 days ago and just the wicked the the wicked way that he got that shot off blows my mind it blew everyone's mind everyone in the arena everyone across america everyone across the world that was a shot heard around the world all right so Kyrie Irving insane insane sensational shot what helped the Mavs beat the reigning champions was their rebounding. Given what I've said about the Mavericks early in the season, that's not normal, all right? So, of course, their acquisitions have helped. Drafting Derek Lively has helped. Where this really <laughs> where this really showed was not only the total rebounding numbers, but their offensive rebounding numbers. So the Mavs had a season-high 60 total rebounds and a season-high 22 Offensive rebounds. It's impressive enough to do that when you're the Dallas Mavericks. It's another thing entirely to do it against the Denver Nuggets, who have big men such as Jokic and Aaron Gordon. Off of those 22 sec off of those 22 offensive rebounds, they had 23 second chance points, which ties the fourth most this season for the Mavericks. Despite shooting 10 of 22, about 45.5%, on second chance field goals. Dallas limited Denver's opportunities by allowing only 16 fewer shot attempts, right? So the Mavericks had pretty much, I believe it was 100, and Denver had about 84 field goal attempts. So that helps you win games whenever you don't have the firepower necessary or when you don't have the defense to keep up with Denver. So this is where it really helped out for the Mavericks. On top of that, it was a clutch win. 
right? And Dallas has been one of the best, if not the best, clutch team in the NBA. So let's look at some of their clutch numbers. They've won nine of their last 10 total games. Their only loss was to Oklahoma City without Luka. And then for their clutch record, they've gotten three straight clutch wins versus Miami, versus Denver, at San Antonio. Those were the most recent clutch games. They have a 20-8 and eight clutch record this season, which is the best record in the NBA. It ties the third best clutch record through 28 games in franchise history with only 2010-2011 when the Mavs won the title. I have said this before. In their last 13 clutch games, they are 10-3. and three. So they have been on a great stretch considering they started about 10 and five they're now 10 and three and seem to be improving in the clutch here's some notes about their clutch record they have the third fewest clutch games played in the nba pretty opposite of how they experienced it last year where they were about top two in games played they have the they they're tied for the sixth most wins in the clutch in the nba and they have the fewest clutch losses in the NBA. And then among their shooting splits, they shoot 47.6% from the floor in the clutch, and that is sixth, 38.2% from three, which is third, and 85.1% from the stripe, which is fourth. So they are highly efficient in the clutch. Speaking of efficiency, let's look, in, let's look at their clutch ratings. On the offensive side, 128 offensive rating that's second in the nba 107.7 defensive rating which is ninth in the nba and a 20.3 net rating which is fourth in the nba so dallas becomes a different team entirely when it comes down to those last five minutes in tight games speaking of you know getting that offense going how do you do that you do that by sharing the ball interesting note for the mavericks they have 30 or more assists in four straight games. So now they are 14-1 and one this season when they have 30 or more assists. This does include the game against Sacramento on March 26th that, that was played on TNT. This is being recorded Friday. Later in the night, the Mavs will play the Kings again in Sacramento. Speaking of assists, Dallas became Lob City 2.0 versus the Utah Jazz. All right. They had a franchise record 18 dunks Thursday night versus the Jazz. Thursday a week ago versus the Jazz. 13 was the previous franchise record. They blew that out of the water by five. It was a season high across the NBA and tied the second most dunks in a game in the play-by-play -play era. Only behind 20 dunks by the Clippers. And that was around 2019. All right, so somehow... I say somehow, it's it's actually pretty obvious. You got big men, you got the pick and roll, you got Luka and Kyrie, everyone's dunking, it's Lob City. All right, speaking of Luka, he's on a triple-double tear again. He went on a triple-double tear again. He had two triple-doubles in the span of three games from March 19th to the 25th. That gives him 19 triple-doubles on the season. That's the third most behind Sabonis, who has 25, and Jokic, who has 22. 19 triple-doubles is also the most in a season in Luka's career. His previous most was 17, and he already passed that. He has 75 career triple-doubles. Mind you, this guy just turned 25 a month ago. He's one shy of tying James Harden for eighth most all time. And he's only three shy of tying Wilt Chamberlain for seventh. So he's he's hitting he's hitting the history books as if he hasn't done it already. All right, now let's take a look at the Kings game because this one I didn't expect for it to be a blowout, but it was. All right, so March 26th at Sacramento, Luka Doncic started the first half with 26 points, 7 rebounds and 5 assists. Yeah, that sounds like what he could do in a whole game. He did that in a half. That was his 44th career half with 25 plus points. And 21 of them have come this season. So he's doing it more this year. 
Sounds like an MVP to me. All right, 46th career half with 25 and 5. 17th career half with 25, 5 and 5. He he does this really often. It, it, it gets to the point where we're really tracking every single time. He finished the game with 28 points, 11 rebounds, and 6 assists. Did not play in the fourth quarter. Got some well-deserved rest. Especially considering that that was a back-to-back when you had the Utah game, the second Utah game, Monday, March 25th, and then the Sacramento game, Tuesday, March 26th, and there was traveling between all of that. All right, for the Mavericks, they shot 22 of 39 from three. All right, so their 22 threes made tied the third most this season, tied the eighth most in franchise history, and it was the 40th game in Mavs history with 20 or more threes made. Their 22 of 39 shooting from three gave them a 56.4% three-point percentage. That percentage was the Mavs' best this season, and it was the second-best three-point percentage in Mavs history when in games when they made 20 or more threes. On top of that, this is the most surprising part for me. They had a 42.4% three-point rate. That's the fifth lowest in Mavs history when they make 20 or more threes. It ties the 14th lowest in the NBA this season when a team makes 20 or more threes in the game. There are 111 instances of a team making 20 or more threes this season. So they're just outside the, I guess, bottom 10% when it comes to three-point rate in a game. Now, if you want to see this trend shift, right? They used to live and die by the three. They don't really do that anymore. 30 games this season have a 45% three-point rate or higher on the Mavericks. That all came before February 10th. So let me let me say this again. They had 30 games this season with a 45% three-point rate or higher before February 10th. Since then, four games. That's it. 17 games last season post-trade deadline with 45% of a three-point rate or higher. 39 games before. So a total of 56 last year. This year, they're only at 34 games. You can see the shift throughout the entirety of the season, but really that swing at the trade deadline, having 30 before the deadline and four since, that makes a world of a difference when it comes to the Mavericks' identity. Included in that trade and in that identity is P.J. Washington. And I want to highlight this specifically because in the Kings game, he had 14 points on 5 of 11 shooting, 45.5%. 4 of 6 from 3, 66.7%. With 13 rebounds and 2 assists. That was his third double-double this season across both Charlotte and Dallas. It was actually his first double-double with Dallas. And now Dallas is 8-4 and four this season when at least two Mavericks have a double-double in the same game. Interesting note there. Let's take a look at some potential playoff matchups. And by some, I mean one. Because every day, the standings change like crazy. So as I record this, right now the Mavericks are in the sixth spot. They would have to play whoever is in the third spot. And that is the OKC Thunder. So as I preview what happens for the Pelicans and the Thunder, take what I say about the Thunder now, because that's going to apply later. I'm not going to repeat this in the second segment. All right. This series between the Mavs and the Thunder, potentially, could go six or seven games. In my mind, both of these teams' strengths are attacking the paint with pick and rolls, drives and kicks, shooting, but with different traits. OKC with their efficiency and Dallas with their volume. And their execution in the clutch. How they play in clutch time. Strengths that are overwhelmingly favoring the Mavs is their size. They can overwhelm the Thunder defense, create mismatches inside while forcing chaos, and they get shooters open in order to keep up with OKC's efficiency, right? OKC can get you on the first shot. Dallas can get a lot of second-chance opportunities with the Thunder's inability to rebound offensively. 
Another strength for the Mavericks is that they have Luka and Kyrie. It's just plain and simple. When you have those two guys on the floor, not very many people can beat them. The two-man guard tandem can also run actions for each other. We don't see that all the time, but when they do, they're really effective. And that's without the big men, right? When the big men get involved, it's almost impossible to stop either guard. Because then you decide, okay, if I'm going to put two on the ball, he's going to get you with a pass to Daniel Gafford or Derek Lively, whoever is screening. If you decide to play and drop coverage, your guard is open and they're a great shooter. Luka is shooting really well from three, and we know how well Kyrie shoots from anywhere. Then, across the whole team, they have speed and they hustle. I did find these notes today, although I've been constructing this rundown for a little while. The Mavs score 15.7 fast break points per game this season. Totally different than where they were last year, especially before getting Kyrie. So their 15.7 fast break points per game this season is fifth in the NBA. They recover 6.2 loose balls per game, which is first in the NBA. They actually lead the league in that category. So they really hustle towards loose balls. And they have 10.2 screen assists per game, which is fourth in the NBA. Assists off screens. Very indicative of how they play in the pick and roll. The strengths for the Thunder are on their defense, right? That's where it starts. They have one of the best overall defenses in the NBA and teams in the NBA. Their offensive and defensive efficiency is fantastic. They're physical and can force turnovers and limit shots. So even if they don't get a turnover, they can make your life miserable on that side of the ball. They deflect really, really well, which leads to those turnovers. They have 16.2 deflections per game, which is first in the NBA. And they have an edge in their coaching. And that's just by watching... Jason Kidd versus Mark Dagnall. Mark Dagnall can get his players to recognize how to adjust to an opposing defense. And we haven't gotten a chance to see how he executes in the playoffs, but given how well he adjusts in a single game, that's only going to be extrapolated across four to seven games. We'll really see him in his element, Dagnall, I mean, in his element, across a seven-game series. Jason Kidd seems to have a strength as well whenever he coaches in a playoff series, not so much in a single game. He tends to have some lapses here and there. But once these two teams go at it in the playoffs, either against each other or against their own, their other opponent, depending on the standings, we'll really see how well these coaches can execute when it comes to making adjustments not only within a single game, but across the whole series. An important caveat to mention on this series is that in both Dallas losses, Luka and Kyrie each missed a game. And it was December 2nd when Kyrie did not play. Luka led the charge that drove the Mavs on a 30 to nothing run against the Thunder, in which the Thunder, led by Chet Holmgren on that run, took back the lead, and then ended up winning the game in Dallas. March 14th in Oklahoma City, Luka was not available in that game. He hurt his hamstring in the Golden State game prior and did not even travel to OKC. The Mavs almost won that game anyway, but they lost Josh Green early, and then the Thunder overwhelmed them on the defensive side of the ball. The verdict, to me, when both teams are fully healthy, that's the most important note is that the Mavs can win this in six. I don't give as much credit to the Thunder as I should when I say that, but really the rebounding is an issue. It, it's just too much of an issue. And when the calls by referees allow for more physicality, Dallas can get more physical with you. If they can get more physical with you, that means your efficiency from the floor might not be as good. If the Thunder stay efficient, that's a different story. I expect the Mavericks to be better defenders in the postseason. To me, Dallas can win all three games at home. They're just a juggernaut at home, especially against the Thunder. The Thunder have had to deal with that. 
even though they won the first game, they almost lost it on that 30 nothing run. And then on the second game, they got blown out completely on the first game with the new acquisitions. And then Dallas has more of an, has more of an ability to steal one of the games in OKC. So that, along with the Mavericks in the clutch time, they have the edge there. They're first in the NBA. OKC is only a few spots behind them, but they're still formidable. The inexperience of the Thunder is another ta- is another thing that other analysts have said might be the Achilles heel for the uh, for Oklahoma City. Even if it isn't, I think when it comes to late game execution and how these teams play, their styles of play as of now, the Mavericks have the edge and can win 4-2 in a 7 game series. Let's transition now to the Pelicans and how I think of the Thunder with how they've played most recently. That's coming up next. Let's look at the South Beach showdown between the New Orleans Pelicans and the Miami Heat. The Pels got their revenge in Miami. They held the Heat to 36% shooting from the floor and 27.7% from three. And speaking of their threes, Miami shot only 13 of 47 from three. That's a little odd. That was a season high in attempts. The Heat don't shoot 47 threes a game. Their rate, their three-point rate this season is only 38.8%, which is it's still the 14th highest in the NBA, but not enough to justify that 47 of their shots came from beyond the arc. Then CJ McCollum led the way with 30 points on 12 of 21 shooting, 57.1% from the floor, 6 of 12 from 3, with 5 rebounds, 7 assists, and a steal. So this was his 5th 30-point game this season. He still has 5 on the season. After this game, the Pelicans improved to 10-0 on the season when CJ scores 25 or more points in a game. Then let's look at the Pelicans' threes against the heat they shot 18 of 36 that's 50 percent from three that's a lot the pels are nine and oh this season when shooting 50 percent from three they're also nine and oh when they make 18 or more threes in a game they they didn't all happen at the same time those are not all different games but they're not all the same games but no matter what they're undefeated when they have those stats Then let's take a look at the second line. That is the nickname for the Pelicans bench that they like to use in the New Orleans market. Jose Alvarado led the bench with 17 points on 6 of 12 shooting from the floor, 4 of 7 from 3. He had season highs in points, field goals made, and threes made. And then Najee Marshall contributed with 13 points. As a whole, the bench unit for the Pelicans, the second line, scored 45 points points against the Heat. The Pelicans are now 12 and 0 this season when their bench scores 45 or more. And that's been a strength of the Pelicans that they are deep, that they can go to anyone on their bench and that person will contribute. So with Brandon Ingram out and more role players coming into the starting lineup, the rest of the bench is still really good. All right. The second important game in the most recent stretch for the Pelicans was the Bucks game. And this one slightly surprised me. So Zion and CJ led the way. Zion had 28 points. CJ had 25. I'll touch on that note in a moment. CJ McCollum had a game-high 18 points in the first half. So he really led the way early on. All five Pelican starters scored 10 or more points in this game. So New Orleans is now 11 and four this season when all five starters are in double figures because they beat the Bucks. The Pels shot poorly, but won anyway. All right, they shot eight of 32, which is 25%, from three. They're three and 11 this season when making eight or fewer three-pointers. That snapped a three-game losing streak. 
that doesn't happen very often, right? You don't shoot eight threes, you don't make eight threes and win games. They're two and five this season when shooting 25% or below from three. That snapped a five game losing streak. So they won their first game, lost their next five, and now they've won their seventh. This was supplemented, or at least the fact that they didn't shoot well and still won the game was supplemented by their points off turnovers. And this was something that David Wesley said in the Pelicans Live post game after, after that game ended between New Orleans and Milwaukee. The Pelicans had 17 points off turnovers. And, by the way, the Pelicans' record when they score 17 or more points off turnovers this season is 29-10. and 10. Need I say more? All right, then I do want to take a look at the Milwaukee Bucks in this game very slightly and relate it back to the Pelicans. The Bucks had three 20-point scores in Giannis with 35, and then Damian Lillard and Malik Beasley each had 20. This is the third straight loss for the Bucks with three 20-point scores, and they're 12-9 and nine on the season. New Orleans, on the other hand, got their seventh win this season despite allowing three 20-point scores, improving their record on the season to 7-10. and 10. Speaking of 20-point scores, CJ, CJ McCollum, is going to be the most important player down the stretch for the New Orleans Pelicans, outside of Zion Williamson, of course. Let's take a look at how the Pelicans benefit from CJ playing well. CJ as a score, all right, New Orleans is 11 and 0 this season when CJ scores 25 or more. That now includes the Bucks game. As a passer, New Orleans is 10 and 1 this season when CJ has 7 or more assists. And as a shooter, New Orleans is 25 and 5 this season when CJ shoots 45% from the floor. They're also 23 and 5 this season when CJ shoots 40% from three, all right? So some of those games are blended together. Some of them are not. Regardless, CJ, CJ McCollum has to step up in place of Brandon Ingram, and he can do it. He has done it. He just has to hold the fort until B.I. can come back and the Pelicans are fully healthy for a potential deep playoff run. But... The Pelican success is going to ride first on Zion being Zion, but also CJ taking it to the next level. And all of these stats and all of these records are showing that he is that important to the offense of the New Orleans Pelicans. Let's take a look at a potential playoff matchup for the Pels. They've been stuck in the five spot and they haven't really moved up or down in a little while. So when you look at the, at the standings, who they would have to face, that would be the number four LA Clippers. This is a seven-game series in the making. The Pelicans won the season series three to one, but with Ty Lu, you can never count that man out. The toughest test would probably be to escape Kawhi's defense and limit him on the offensive side, Paul George, and James Harden as well, because all three of them are scoring machines. And then let's not forget about Russell Westbrook and the way he plays on both ends of the ball. The strengths for the Pelicans, they have, to me, more than the Clippers. The Pelicans have a 111.4 defensive rating, which is fifth in the NBA. A 5.4 net rating, which is fourth in the NBA. Their field goal and three-point defense is also really good. 46% opponent field goal percentage, which is fifth in the NBA and 34.5% opponent three-point field goal percentage, which is first in the NBA. They have the best three-point defense and the fifth, the, the fifth best overall defense when it comes to shooting. They also steal the ball really, really well. They have 8.2 steals per game, which is third in the NBA, and they shoot the ball really well from the corner. On corner threes, the Pelicans shoot 42.6%, and that leads the NBA. And then, of course, I already mentioned the second line, the bench unit for the Pelicans. Their depth 
is another strength for them. They have a 3.5 bench net rating, which is second in the NBA. So they are very dependable from top to bottom. Let's look at some strengths for the Clippers. The offensive efficiency for the Clippers is through the roof. It's like 118.9. That's third in the NBA. And then their three-point and free-throw shooting is also absurdly high throughout the course of the season. 38.7% from three, which is fourth in the NBA, and 82% from the free-throw line, which is fourth in the NBA. Of course, because I believe this is a seven-game series, it's really a toss-up as to who would win. And it's really going to going to come down to who can execute because the Pelicans have had issues in the clutch. They have issues in close games when, when the margin is within three. But the Clippers are not, they're not as dominant as they used to be. Of course, Russell Westbrook's injury has a part to play in that. But the way the Pelicans can play they can win a seventh game on the road if they if they got to that point. The Clippers, however, in this situation, in this scenario, would have home court. And it would be difficult to beat Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, and James Harden, and Russell Westbrook, and Tyron Lu at home. If any team could do it, though, it is the Pelicans. I think the Pelicans could squeak by in a seven-game series there. But that will be more solidified. That idea will be more solidified as we get closer to the end of the regular season. Let's transition to the Thunder because their second chance points over their four-game win streak before their most recent loss, or at least before their most recent loss is, they had a four-game win streak between March 14th through the 22nd. Their, their second chance points across that stretch was an important note for me to to me to mark down for me to mark down I should say mainly because they don't do very well on the offensive boards they don't do well scoring second chance points they don't really attempt very many shots in the second chance but they outscored their opponents in second chance points during this four game streak so versus Dallas they were plus 2 which their uh, their second chance points numbers were twenty three to twenty one. At Memphis, the next game was also plus two, eleven to nine. Then at home versus Utah, plus four, eighteen to fourteen. And then at Toronto was actually plus ten, twenty one to eleven. They scored eighteen point three second chance points per game during their four game win streak, which ties for first in the NBA. Then. Let's take a look at their bounce back versus the Pelicans because they did have a little bit of a rough stretch. They did lose to the Milwaukee Bucks by 25. And then since the New Orleans win, they did lose to Houston in overtime, but Shea did not play in that game. So March 26th at the Pelicans, OKC's largest lead was 20 in the third quarter at 86 to 66. The Pelicans, however, came st- Storming back, New Orleans shot 10 of 20 from the floor and 6 of 11 from 3 in the third quarter. They eventually took the lead by as many as 5 in the fourth at 112 to 107. But from that point on, after CJ scored a floater with 311 remaining, the Thunder just said, nah, we're ending this right now. They went on a 12 0 run, and I'm going to credit the graphics associate producer in the New Orleans Pelicans truck. Ryan Doyle for asking for these stats from our stats team on our Slack channels from Sport Radar. They give us a lot of extra stuff that we can't get on our own. He had all of this written down. They confirmed it. So I just want to highlight this run. The Thunder went on a 12 0 run in points, shot four of six from the floor to the Pelicans, zero for five. The Thunder hit two free throws. Only attempted two free throws, but they went two of two. The Pelicans didn't even attempt one. And then OKC had seven rebounds in this stretch. New Orleans did not have a single one. Lots of goose eggs in these stats. So that leads to the Thunder's execution in the clutch 
and why they've been one of the best teams when it comes to finishing games. Also why the Pelicans have had a bit of an issue finishing games. But let's continue to look at the Thunder's success despite having some of these rebounding issues. Of course, it didn't show itself in this Pelicans game. They out-rebounded them there. The Thunder are 24 and 21 this season when they're out rebounded. That's a 53.3% win percentage, which is third best in the NBA. They're 26 and 1 this season when they match or out rebound their opponents. And their only loss was earlier in the season to the Indiana Pacers, which I've mentioned before. Currently, their win percentage when out rebounding or matching their opponents in rebounds this year is 96.3%. And that would be the best in a season in NBA history if it holds, although they have only the third fewest games played in that situation. So there's not very many games left. They, they still have about 10 games, and they've got the sixth toughest remaining schedule. They've got a strength of schedule of 0.536, a 53.6 strength of schedule, however they like to put that number together. Five games at home, five on the road, and starts tonight at home against Phoenix, who are are also desperate to get out of the play-in. So that's going to be important for the Thunder to try to finish strong. They could potentially get to one of the higher seeds if they want. No matter who they're going to play, they're going to have a tough time because they've got Dallas at the six. They could have Sacramento or Phoenix at the seven. If they were to get all the way to number one, they would have to deal with the LA Lakers, with the Golden State Warriors, with either the Phoenix Suns or Sacramento Kings, depending on how that game goes, or even the Houston Rockets, who just beat them in overtime. So it's important for the Thunder to finish strong, make sure that they know exactly what they need to do, and get the best playoff matchup possible for them, not only for the first round, but for the rest of the postseason. All right, now let's transition to our matchups of the week. There are plenty that are coming up that are very important for the Mavericks, the Pelicans, and the Thunder. That is coming up in the the next segment. In the next episode, we'll take a quick updated recap on the Mavericks, Pelicans, and Thunder up until that point. Take a look at some potential playoff matchups in case the standings shift again, because they always do. But this next episode is going to feature an interview with the former coordinating producer of Fox Sports Southwest, Oklahoma, and New Orleans. He's worked in high level in a high-level position with the Dallas Mavericks. He is a, an adjunct professor at Baylor University. This is where I met him. And we sat down for a lengthy conversation about his career, the industry as a whole, the technology that has changed the game. This is going to be the first of many. And this was one of my goals for this show since the very beginning, since I was putting it together in my head. And it will signify the 21st episode, which, as I said at the very top of this episode... Only 1% of podcasts everywhere make it to episode 21. And for that to be the 21st episode, to feature the person that got me into the industry, that to me is very important. So I appreciate all of you who have made it to this point, and I hope you guys stick around for every episode after. He's a conversation you don't want to miss. So be on the lookout for that. That's coming after this episode. Let's take a look at the matchups of the week for the Dallas Mavericks. From Friday, March 29th to Tuesday, April 2nd, they have to play the Kings again. Then they play the Rockets and they play the Warriors all on the road. Now, the Kings, they did just beat up on. However, that doesn't happen twice in a row. You got to watch out for the Kings again. They're still formidable, even without Kevin Herter and his shoulder injury. The Rockets did just beat Oklahoma City in overtime, even though it was without Shea Gilders Alexander, but they are on a 10 game win streak and you cannot look past them anymore. Ime Udoka has that team playing at an all time high, even without Shen Goon. 
And then the Warriors, again, desperate. Doesn't matter what Draymond Green does to get himself uh, kicked out of a game, but Steph Curry is still going to Steph Curry. So the Dallas Mavericks need to watch out for all three of these teams. For the Pelicans, Saturday, March 30th to Wednesday, April 3rd, it's a homestand for them, but they've got the Celtics, best team in the NBA, who did just lose two straight to Atlanta, somehow. They also have the Phoenix Suns, who are desperate to get out of the play-in, as I've said before. They also have the Orlando Magic, who beat them in Orlando. They're big. They're not great at shooting, but somehow in that game, they were great at shooting, and so the Pelicans just have to really lock down on defense and hold them like they do other teams, score them. They're, they should be fine. However, without Brandon Ingram, it, the Pelicans have to really focus, lock in, and make sure everyone is on the same page so that they can execute on all three of these games. Then for the Thunder, they have the roughest stretch of all three of these teams. From Friday, March 29th to Friday, April 5th, they have a home game against Phoenix. But then they go on the road to play the New York Knicks, then the Philadelphia 76ers, then the Boston Celtics, and then the Indiana Pacers. That is not an easy stretch by any means. I've already mentioned the Celtics are the best team in the NBA. The Sixers are desperate without Joel Embiid. We don't know when he's coming back, although Nick Nurse has said that Joel is is hopeful to come back by the end of the regular season. I've already mentioned Phoenix multiple times. New York is still dealing with some injuries, but Jalen Brunson is Jalen Brunson. All right, that's another dude. That's, that's another brother. Those of you in the Dallas area, we all know how good he is. And then the Pacers beat the Thunder in the last meet, in the last meeting. So there needs, there needs to be some urgency if the Thunder, not for the Thunder to think that they would fall past third, but just so that they stay in a rhythm as they get into the postseason. Because at some point, they are going to clinch their spot. So that's it for the matchups of the week. Thank you again for watching this episode all the way through if you've made it to this point and for listening, those of you listening on audio. I am very appreciative of all your support all the way through this point, through the 20th episode. There's still plenty more to come. That does it for me. This has been The Control Room. I'm your host, Estral Johannes, signing off.